Hey everyone, and welcome to episode six of the Parallel Magic Podcast, the science fiction and fantasy book show. I'm Kate M. Colby, joined as always by my friend and co-host Jonas Lee. How's it going today, Jonas? It is a good day. It is nearly spring, technically spring, I should say, but it's thawing out here in the Midwest. So unlike you in California, uh, we're actually looking forward to these days of muddy, crappy, dirt, mud, all that. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing really well. Yeah, the uh, muddy, crappy, dirty rain has been our winter. And mm. just earlier this week, it hit the low 70s. So we are officially in California spring, and I cannot complain. Well, there you go. So what are you drinking this this day? Well, speaking of sunny California, I am <laughs> drinking a Chardonnay from the Napa Valley. Ooh. Now, what's what's the Chardonnay? What's, what's distinctive about it? I don't know wine, so I'm just going to break into what does that mean? <laughs> oh, well, luckily for you, I am yeah. something of a wine copywriter by trade. Oh, how about that? Uh, Chardonnay is known for its ripe orchard fruit flavors. And it's a very versatile grape, so you can age it in oak, and it grows well in a lot of different places. And, uh, you know, it's actually the world's most popular white grape. And it's a grape that I haven't liked for a long time, but this one is pretty good. So I'm, I'm starting to join the Chardonnay All Day Club. Chardonnay All Day or Day. Good deal. What are you drinking? I am, since we're, we're doing an apocalypse book, I had to think to myself, I, I try to do something thematic and it doesn't always work out and I'm not sure it really works out today, but I'm thinking like, what, what would be left in an apocalypse? I mean, certainly it's just going to be something whiskey based. So I don't have whiskey. I had a Johnny Walker blue label scotch, which I will be sipping on because I am not in my twenties anymore. I can't do shots. That shit is not going to work. <laughs> Fair enough. Yes, and that's a great apocalypse tip. So when the apocalypse comes, drink your white wines first because they have the lowest shelf life, <laughs> then your reds, right. and then, you know, move into your, your stronger liquors based on the uh, alcohol content. Yeah, save that's all the it. spam, save all that, that high proof stuff. Keep that tucked away. And since it's, it's hard liquor, if you still have freezers available, it's all good because it won't freeze. It won't shatter bottles. It'll be good for you. Exactly. All right. So speaking of the post-apocalypse theme, today we are reviewing Wool by Hugh Howey, and that's the first book in his Silo trilogy. Yes. And I apologize if I don't have more of an explanation for this book. It was very hard for me to find uh, just something more detailed like I've been giving everybody. So I found a tiny little paragraphish synopsis out there on Amazon, actually. So here we go. It says, thousands of them lived underground. They'd lived there so long, there are only legends about people living anywhere else. Such a life requires rules, strict rules. There are things that must not be discussed, like going outside. Never mention you might like going outside, or you'll get what you wish for. Which kind of leads into the premise of what this book is. So, with that in mind, we're let's give just a brief synopsis of... Are we just going to do the first in this series, right? Yes, yeah. Okay, so we're just doing Wool. So if anybody's out there that has read the entire... I, I read the... Or I should say I listened to the entirety on Audacity... Or on Audible, excuse me, of the Wool Omnibus series. So we'll just go into the first part and the second part's... Oh, God, remind me what they are again. <laughs> yeah, the second book is Shift, and the third book is Dust. Dust, that's right. Okay, so it starts off with this bleak-feeling environment that's outside, and one woman is actually, I believe, requesting to go out. She doesn't want to be inside anymore, and she's the sheriff's wife, correct? Correct. Okay, so in that whole synopsis of it she just they want people to go outside that's kind of a i guess what you want to call it, a sacrifice and glorifying and also a punishment 
to go outside and they have to clean the I think the air scrubbers off. That's their yeah. They clean off the camera lenses. So basically, this whole society is living in an underground silo. So if you're from Kansas like me and you're driving past and seeing all the grain silos, just basically picture a giant one of those underground. And the outside world where we all currently live is entirely uninhabitable. It's just this dusty wasteland. So when people are sent outside, um, the hazardous environment breaks down their protective suits and they're dead within minutes. Mm -hmm. But at the very top level of the silo, they have these screens that show an image of the outside. There's like a continuous video feed showing the outside world because they're hoping that one day it will be habitable again. So whenever these people are sent outside, either as their punishment or their form of suicide they choose, um, their goal is to clean off the camera lenses as much as possible before the environment kills them. So, you know, a really fun place to be. Yeah, so this is definitely a good episode to drink along with us because it's yeah. nice and bleak. If you haven't started drinking yet, better get a glass. It, I, I attributed a lot of this in the same way I when I read The Road, and I didn't read all of The Road, I, I have to admit that. Just because it <laughs> it was such a chaotic, bleak mess that it almost stopped me on this book too. I think that's why me going through it in an um, audiobook fashion let me get to the end of it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I think I might have stopped just because it is just this, everything's underground, so you feel that kind of claustrophobia coming in. And when we mean underground, I mean there's like 140 floors, I believe. Yeah, or that 140 floors is where the mechanic level is. I think there's actually levels underneath that. So, I mean, that's a huge skyscraper inverted into the ground, essentially. But the the that feel of the book kind of had me just a little bit on edge as far as I think was what it should do. I mean, it's apocalypse book. You shouldn't be just like happy-go-lucky What? what's going to be around the next corner. It's probably just rainbows and butterflies and balloons and all kinds of stuff. So it gives you that feel of like, there's nowhere to go underground really. I mean, essentially, and there's nowhere to go outside. So you have this, this environment for conflict. Yeah. The sense of isolation and just dread, I think is something that Howie does really well throughout the novel, because you see that, in the way the characters act, in the way they talk about the outside and don't talk about it. Because if you show any desire to go outside, you're going to get sent out there to die. And I mean, as someone, you know, as a normal person in the real world, the idea of being trapped underground forever is horrifying. And I just kept waiting the whole book for like the silo to implode or, you know, something like that to happen. Because just my mind was racing with all the worst case scenarios that could happen. But I mean, maybe this reveals something about my character. We did learn last episode that I'm a Slytherin, but I loved this book (laughs) so much. I love the whole trilogy. And this is one of those novels, like I've always loved everything about the apocalypse, whether it's supernatural or, you know, biological or whatever in books and movies. And this is one of those books that I wish I had written. Like, I just, I cannot get enough of this stuff. It's like when you, when you see some invention on TV and you go, damn it, I thought of that. Why didn't I just do it? That this is you in that book. Yeah. I can't claim to have had this great of an idea because I think it's a fantastic idea. And when you when you read the whole trilogy and you get all of your questions answered, I just, I think it's brilliant. I know some people think it's crap, but I think it's brilliant. And so, yeah, I wish it's like, damn it. I wish I had that idea and I wish I beat him to it. But I was like, I don't know. I, I was like 18, I think when he first started writing this, something like that. So mm. there was no way my, my puny teenage brain was going to dream this up. Couldn't compute all of that at once. No, probably not. Oh, well, 
there, there, there's a there's a there's a space for you out there in the apocalypse world. I'm sure you're going to find your niche sooner or later. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Yeah, the I mean, from and I, I'm sure you know a little bit more about Hugh Howie and this journey than I do. I just kind of I think I actually picked this up from you as a recommendation about a year and a half ago because you read it you read it a couple years back and I'm like all right well. Like I, I like Apocalypse, uh, I like the the premise of it, so I'll give it a shot. And we went through it on Audible. The Audible version was very, very in tuned with making you feel like there's dread somewhere. You just don't know where it is. But it's also got to a confusing point too that we can get into a little bit later. Um, but from what from what you pick up um, audibly versus reading it, I think it gets a little bit different because if you if you read something, you're going line by line. Like there's times where your eyes might skip over it, but you go right back. In Audible, you kind of like, did I just miss something? Shit. And then you have to rewind, you know, 30 seconds or 15 seconds, whatever it may be, and see if you pick it up again. But um, now Hugh started us off as like a short story series. Is, is that accurate? I believe so. So if okay. my memory serves, which full disclaimer, it may not. Um, <laughs> Hugh originally posted this as a short story, but it blew up on the internet. People just loved it. So he decided to publish the first book, Wool, as a serial, which is a term that independent authors were using back in the day, where you would basically post a section of a book, um, like one at a time, and then eventually compile it into the entire book. So if you think of like TV episodes, you see one episode at a time, and then eventually it's compiled into the full season, you know, back in the day on DVD, now to Netflix. Right. Um, so that was the initial publishing model. And eventually it became so popular that he actually got a deal with a traditional publishing company. And I believe he sold them the paperback rights. But um, if I have my facts straight, Hugh Howey actually still owns the ebook rights. So he's a tr he's kind of a hybrid publisher and the book is hybridly published which i think is just a really cool thing you know as an author who's independently published and who has great respect for the traditional publishing world i think it's really cool to see that hybrid model in one book yeah and i mean i'm not sure if he's one of the first but he's got to be one of the more pioneering people in science fiction who is really indie and then suddenly kind of gets catapulted through fans into this this world of like guess what you're gonna be you're gonna be hybrid now you can still be independent but we want your book <laughs> it's because I, I actually after i read or not read but after i listened to the the omnibus i went back because there was a deal in uh, i think comiXology or something like that where the graphic novel is only like 99 cents and I don't know. I'm a sucker for 99 cent deals <laughs> when it's something interesting, whether I read it or not. I'm just like, yeah, let's just put that in the card and put that in the card. And yeah, one more. <laughs> so, so I get to that point and I actually walked through that again a little bit today just to kind of refresh my memory. And I didn't get all the way, obviously, but the, the depictions that they do in that graphic novel are very concise with if you had, a, I guess what you want to call an abridged version, because mm -hmm. it, it doesn't skip over the bad or, you know, certain parts it kind of gets a little bit everything but it kind of condenses all the the dialogue together and the action that you need together so he actually hit three different platforms within the span of like two three years with that that series so he had paperback he had audio audio he had visual and paper or ebook i guess you could say yeah. uh, i'm sure they have paperback copies of graphic novels for it too but yeah he he, he's a real go-getter. Yeah, I know. It's very cool to see something that, you know, readers championed and readers helped propel outwards because, you know, if the reader response hadn't been so great, Howie might not have gotten the story out there in all those different formats. So podcasts like this, your reviews on Amazon, mm -hmm. Goodreads, and the other retailers, they matter. And if you let your voice be heard... You know, you could make the next wool. You could. You never know, right? Well, I th uh, was there anything in the the writing that you remember that you want to 
talk about before we get into the more of the the details of wool yeah um what i liked about this is being a science fiction novel most of the writing was pretty i guess i'll call it functional you know Mm -hmm. it's it's not big on lyrical prose you know with sci-fi you're telling the story you're getting to the action points and you know that's your main focus but even though the writing was very precise and functional like that, Howie's word choice, I thought, was just impeccable. Like, he could say something in one sentence, and I would immediately feel how Juliet, the protagonist, feels, or I would see this gritty wasteland exactly, you know, perfectly vividly as if I was standing right inside of it. So I just thought that his, the intention of his language and his word choice was really, really strong and vivid. Yeah. Whenever you can get an author that, that really paints that picture. And I I probably mentioned before, but when I always go back to and a legend himself with Stephen King, he has that way of, you can definitely tell the author's voice after a few books because he has that way of methodically pulling you in. And even though he's not into the story yet, he's just into this little side story. You just feel like you're on this little tiny adventure ride the whole way. And he's not overusing big words. He's just picking them the way that they need to. And from when I listened to this book, when they're depicting the landscape, that's what really sold it for me. Just that that bleak, dirty, crap world out there. That part, you could you could almost feel it around you while you're listening. So I, I can feel it that way if if that's me correlating with you (laughs) (laughs) so before we get into the spoilers what is your shot rating for wool for now i have to break this down because we're really only doing the first one and i've read the entirety so i kind of have to stymie myself down to uh number one i'm trying to think where it ends so that's where we I'm kind of like. can't say crap. until the spoiler section. I know. So if if I'm going off of it in thirds, trying to think of the first third, I would give this. I would probably give it an eight out of ten. Um, and and I know I know, I know you love this book, and the reason I say eight out of ten is just because there was great description, there was great atmosphere, everything's very unique. But there's also that sense that always held me back, like, I don't know if I want to keep reading this just because it is so bleak and he's doing so well in describing this world that it kind of puts me puts me on my heels a little bit and go, oh, I just want something fun for a minute. <laughs> so that's what knocks it down a little bit. It has nothing to do with his writing or nothing to do with the novel in itself. But in that first third, that's where I kind of like, um, yeah, it's good. It's really good. I'm going to leave it at that. So That's I, fair. <laughs> Yeah, with you, what would your shot rating be? Well, I want to give a drum roll, but I Ooh. don't want to explode our listeners' eardrums. Right. So we'll, pretend the drum roll's happening. Yes, pretend drum roll, glass clink. <laughs> yeah. Okay, wool is my first 10 out of 10 shot rating. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. I'm so excited. <laughs> so the reason so, I rate it a perfect 10 out of 10 uh, is I think the writing is fantastic. The main character, Juliet, she's, she's relatable. She's flawed, but yet she's a total badass. And I just loved seeing her meet every obstacle that was thrown her way. You know, I like, I think the secondary characters are fleshed out. Well, I love the concept of the world. And even though you don't get, the full extent of the world in the first book, what he presented me and the promise for the sequels, um, I just thought was stellar. I mean, and I'm totally biased because I love the apocalypse and I'm counting down for it. And this is right up my alley. But yeah, this is 10 out of 10. Nice. So I bet you're one of those people too, that when 2012 was coming around, that mind calendar thing was going to happen some part of you is like secretly like yes here we go <laughs> yes i actually the I world did a, is ending finally i did a research project on it in college for my spanish class and 
I was very disappointed to find out it was all hooey. Yeah. When I, ha- I mean, there was part of me that was relieved, obviously. Well, yeah. But there was part of me that was like, oh, well, that's too bad. It's it's something very interesting to hold in tension. Like this idea of I love the world and I love, you know, my, my family and my friends and everything. And I want, I, w- I want the status quo to keep going. But there's just mm-hmm. also this attraction to danger and the unknown and the cathartic of there being no more rules i guess yeah there's there's kind of that wiping the slate clean feel that makes you kind of go yeah we we really need to do that like i'm not really looking forward to the you know mass genocide zombie plague outbreak whatever it might be but party's kind of like yeah that would be kind of nice just a reset like a control all delete let's go back to the the pre-technology age and see if we can do this shit all over again and that's where the rest of us would die because <laughs> we wouldn't know how to do it. Yeah, I mean, like, I have no delusions. I would probably be, like, among the first 10% of people killed. So mm. it, it is what it is, but it, it's fun to entertain the fantasy that I'd be a total badass. Yeah, well, you can always keep that going. I mean, I think Midwesterners especially have this somewhat survival sense because of all the conditions that we're in. So I like to think that we could at least make make it, you know, half the distance to the end of of that apocalypse alone. I mean, I know how to hunt. I know how to build a fire. I'm pretty sure we can make it on that as long as I don't get sick. <laughs> when that happens, my ass is dead. Pretty much. Pretty much. All right. So at this point, we're going to get off our tangent yeah, and, uh, and go into spoilers for wool. So We'll just be talking about the first book in the Silo Trilogy. So if you've read the other two, you are ahead of the game. And if you've read that first part, you're safe. Otherwise, back out now and return to us when you have finished it. Warning is done. Now let's get into this. So when does the first book end? (laughs) Okay, Yeah, it's all kind of a blur when you read them all together. So the first book ends with Juliet becoming sheriff. So she's so just to give a recap now that we can do official spoilers for all of our memory's sake. So Juliet is she discovers she becomes sheriff of the silo and she discovers that the cleaners are not getting a an accurate vision of the outside world. So when the cleaners go outside, there's a screen in their suit that shows them a beautiful green pasture. So they think the outside world's actually fine, and that's why they clean the cameras, because they're trying to show everybody else in the silo, hey, it's beautiful out here, we can go outside now. Right, so they're duped into thinking that that they're doing something right, and that's what persuades them to clean them, instead of taking off running for their lives. Exactly. Exactly. So she finds that out, and the head of IT, Bernard, who is our main bad guy, he doesn't want the truth coming out because he believes that, you know, if people in the silo know that there's a conspiracy, that it's just going to be mayhem, chaos, and they're going to all kill each other. So in a way, he thinks he's doing what is right for his people. Yes. So... So so it it actually ends then i I want to know what point not to go into what's the very last thing well because she was sheriff and then she she was she knows about the conspiracy she she doesn't she goes outside she does go outside she does that's on the first book so she goes outside she's sent outside to clean bernard arranges it but she doesn't wear an it suit one of her friends from mechanical and product supply hooks her up with a proper suit like right, made with real doing... materials that won't break down. Yeah, because they had faulty tape. Yeah, and... they they did that on purpose to kill people. Right, because they they wanted them to clean it, but they didn't want them to ever come back in, no matter what. Correct. Gotcha. So then, she makes it to another silo. So this is like the first big twist is that the cleaners have been lied to. The second mm-hmm. big twist is that there are are other silos. Yeah, and when I came across that part listening to the book i was like oh shit yeah that <laughs> i can't believe it that was and, fantastic yeah that part that was i mean that was a great way to if that was the end that was a great way to end it just on that that up note of like guess what else 
but it's yep, not we'll definitely the come end. Through. It's not. <laughs> so, so she goes into the new silo, and mm-hmm. she finds one survivor. So there's tons of corpses in the silo, but there's one person who has survived, and she works with him to, you know, recoup and build a new suit and all of that. And this whole time, she figures out how to talk to her silo. And so she starts talking to the IT apprentice, whose name is Lucas, and they hit it off. They kind of, well, they do fall in love. It's it's our mandatory romance subplot. Mandatory romance coming at you. Oh, yeah. And uh, then eventually... She makes it back to her silo. Is that the end? I believe that is the end. And (laughs) if I have totally screwed this up and revealed something about the second book, I am deeply sorry, but I'm pretty sure. I mean, like my Chardonnay is almost gone, but I'm pretty (laughs) sure. We're half sure that that we are correct. No, I read the synopsis. I caught myself up. Sticking to it. It's all there. And if we ruined anything for you, I'm super sorry, but get ahead of the curve. Come on. Yes. We, we gave you a, a semi-spoiler warning. You have to know we're going to go over it a little bit if we're drinking. So, with that in mind, try to think of how to word it. <laughs> they know about not just the two, though, right? I'm not sure. Damn it. <laughs> I think I think she figures out that there's more. I, that's why I thought and that Lucas, the IT guy was because yeah, Lucas, Lucas was being well. prepped for yeah, being head of IT. Yeah, he all the information. Yeah. So yeah, he knew that. So we know on the first book that there's not just another silo. There was many silos, and some of them fell, and some of them. Yeah, because the second book really gets there. into more about that. Yeah. Okay. One, I want to make sure I didn't completely ruin it, but the the whole animosity of the mechanical people versus it i just kept seeing like some really renegade form of office space happening (laughs) where it's just like all the it nerds versus all the you know salesmen versus you know janitorial staff and that's way my mind was figuring it when i first started reading it so with that all going on do you do you think that you could survive in that kind of this kind of world where it's all just confined and bleak but with purpose, I guess. Yeah, I don't I don't know that I would be happy about it, but I think I could find my niche and play the game. Because one thing that was nice is the society is very segregated and they take their individual tasks very seriously because everything they do functions to keep the silo running. So in a way, when you go to work every day, you really feel like you are a cog in the machine in the best possible way because y- your actions, you know, result in the survival of your people. Right. And like, you know, everyone, if you, like Julia and Mechanical, these people weren't just her coworkers. They were her family. Like they were really close and they come through for her when she needs them the most. And I thought that was a very, it kind of makes an interesting message about like social classes I, I, mm-hmm. I got a little bit of, like, the bourgeois versus the proletariat. Um, but I think it's also a very nice statement, too, about how, like, you know, even though we don't all live in a silo, we're all mm-hmm. in this together and making society function. And, you know, without each other, where would we be? Right. And what I liked about it also, I mean, think of that whole class system, because the lower you go, basically, the lower you are considered. Yes. Because mechanical's on 140, and they're like, oh, those people down there, they're weird. They're just, you know, they've never, they don't know what sunlight is. They don't know what anything is. Well, yeah, some of them have never even been up to see the outside. Right. So you get that in mind. And one of the other things I thought was super interesting is that the most powerful people are the, I mean, are the IT people, but it's because that they control the flow of communication. Mm -hmm. So the communication is really where the power lies, and that's why they were, we live on what that remember that courier service yes. they had to pay you had to pay more to send something electronically and it was like outlandish but you could send this you know runner or whatever down the floors and he'd deliver a note to you 
mm-hmm. and nobody really questioned it, but it was just to control the regulation of communication so that people weren't, you know, communicating with each other saying, hey, do you know that this is happening up on, you know, 52? <laughs> like, no, I'm on 36. I have no idea what's going on. So that that aspect I thought was also a genius part, which uh, I think it just attributes to Hugh Howey as an author. So, and, and that's one of those other things, like when you're saying that I wish I would have write, written this, is that I, I hope that when I write things in the future that I can have that kind of in-depth, I don't know, strategy to it. And I don't know if it yeah. was a strategy initially, but it well, definitely seemed like one. One thing that's interesting about this world is he has created a new world it, and he thought out everything. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, there. I'm always, this is kind of a gross detail, but there are always things in books where I'm like, okay, how do people go to the bathroom and how do, what do you do with their dead bodies? Because those right. are like two really gross, but like realistic Necessary things. things. Yeah. yeah, like you need to know what happens mm-hmm. like at the everyday granular level like that. And like, I think about that all the time with vampire books, just so you know. I'm like, do they go to the bathroom? <laughs> yeah, right? That's, I've wondered Like that something's too. going in, they must have some way of it coming out. Right? So Also gross, but yes, go ahead. <laughs> so what I love, though, is that how he explains all of that. Like when you die, you get buried and fertilize the crops. And, <laughs> you know, like he thought out all these details and it all flowed seamlessly. And like... There are a lot of people, because I read a lot of reviews on Goodreads, and a lot of readers, they can't get on board with this core concept. They're like, I don't believe people could live in something dug in the ground. You know, I don't know how they got there. This doesn't make any sense, blah, blah, blah. But I think if you're able to suspend your disbelief, because it is science fiction, Mm -hmm. and, you know, buy into the concept you're very richly rewarded because he thought it through and he didn't take anything for granted. Yeah. And the only thing that, that I I could possibly even challenge that is just that there's no sunlight. And I, I, I I think that they, what they, the lamps or something that they must use for some sort of vitamin D type. Yeah. I, I can't remember exactly, but I believe that was explained with the lighting in the silo. Yeah. And if anybody yeah. has read it more recently and remembers, you know, please chime in in the comments and let us know. Yeah. Cause I mean, it gets to a point where you, you go over a year out of reading something, you kind of forget the, the minutia of mm-hmm. like, what exactly was that? What exactly was that? And yeah, you, you remember the big ticket items. That's about it. But um, yeah, as far as the, first book goes i mean there's just so much i mean you you get that political intrigue of you know classes and the it portion of it like are they doing it for the right reasons are they doing it for the wrong reasons um like what side are you on and then all of a sudden you find out there's more out there and you kind of go how are they doing it and who's actually in charge is there somebody bigger in charge that kind of thing right so yeah we get to that that point and uh, i guess you have to pump the brakes for me when I when I don't know when I'm going over the first book, but because there's the sheriff, mm-hmm. and that there was a mayor at, at beginning at the beginning of the book, and yes. that mayor actually was I mean I, I believe she was assassinated. I mean they, they poisoned her possibly. I believe so. Yeah. I'm, I, I I'm think she drank something. She was visiting it and she was going down and getting the new sheriff and on their way back up. Mm-hmm. Something happened while she was climbing, and her assistant or whoever it was uh, felt responsible that he was supposed to die, and then he ended up taking his own life. So you have this very like methodical plan going on on top of you know, like you don't really get to touch what what happened outside. You don't really get that that sense of completion that way, where you kind of just have to take for granted that yeah, it's deadly out there. <laughs> That's about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what I like too, though, is even though Bernard, the head of IT, is evil and has this plot against the mayor and he wants power, like, what's ironic is being the head of IT is the most powerful position because he knows all the secrets, you know, yeah. even more secrets than the rear knows until the end of the trilogy. Um, but yet he wants to be the mayor because he wants people to recognize him as the most right. powerful. And I think 
in a way, he really does think he's doing the right thing for the silo. And when you see him training Lucas, you know, he always talks in a way where he seems like he truly believes in what he's doing and he believes that he's right. And that makes it so much more compelling to me because you have his perspective like, yeah, let's keep let's keep everybody in the dark for their own good and continue the status quo as we have for hundreds of years. And then you have Juliet, our hero, who finds out the truth and her strategy is the exact opposite. She's like, nope, we need to tell everyone what's going on. You know, they deserve to know. And she trusts the people to handle the nasty truth and you know, make, make a different way of living. And right. it's interesting because I think both points are valid. Obviously we side with Juliet because she's our protagonist, but right. I like, I like that they're not just all two dimensional. It's not just good versus evil. Yeah. And it, it really does make you think about like, what, what do you think is actually best for a mass group of people living underground? Like you tell them, I mean, you break open the truth and all of a sudden, what what do you think those people are going to do? So I mean, that that's one of those other things that when you get into the later books, you get to kind of get a glimpse of all these different outcomes of what might have been happening in other silos because that does answer a lot of those questions as to not not necessarily for these people, but like if everybody knew the truth and if some people knew the truth and if only one person knew the truth and all of that. So I mean, it really. It's a very well-flavored series, I think. Yes. And I do want to say, if anyone's listening and... Oops, sorry. I had my (laughs) wine glass there. That was was what she was waiting for. Yes. For you to listen in. Uh, Absolutely. So if you are listening and you've read the first book and you're like, "Um, I still have a lot of questions. This world isn't well enough explained. I would really encourage you to stick it out despite the bleakness and read the second and the third because at the end of the first I loved it but I did have some lingering questions and I I was kind of like okay Howie like you think you're pretty clever but how do you explain x y and z and I think he does you know I think when you read the whole trilogy 99 percent at least I mean if not perfect 100 is explained and it all makes sense and if you can buy into the concept from book one, I think you'll find it satisfying. If you're one of those people who can't, then you're going to think it's all horseshit. But yeah. you're probably not listening fun. to this. So probably that's not. That's okay. Probably never pick this up. And they're, they're not like super long books either. Well, I'm trying to see how much. In paperback, well, guess, they felt pretty weighty. Maybe and, when you well, listen to it, it goes faster. I think the entire the entirety of one, two, and three is looks like it's five hundred and about thirty pages, from what Goodreads is telling me. Whether that, whether that's completely true or not, I'm not sure. But I mean, that's a couple hundred pages a book, essentially. Yeah, that that seems a little short to me, but I don't know. It might be. <laughs> you know, with trim sizes and everything, I don't know how mine. It's was very hard to get a, a straightforward answer through Goodreads. Unfortunately, yeah. I'm sorry. But regardless of their length, they're worth it. So stick it out. They're worth it. They're super worth it. Okay. Well, um, I'm afraid to go into anything more without like totally ruining it. And I don't think I could think of anything really from the first third of the book that I would tackle. Do you? <laughs> no, I think I've I've pretty much said my piece. And if anyone does have any more questions, if you want to know our thoughts on a specific detail that we didn't cover, just drop us a note in the comments or hit us up on social media or the Goodreads group. And we will be more than happy to refresh our memories and give you a more detailed answer. Absolutely. And we're, we're continuing on with the apocalypse genre in our next version and next version is actually going to be quite a treat because we're going to get to interview both of the authors that are in it we are doing dawn final awakening it's by jay thorne and zach bohannon and if those names are familiar they also have their own podcast together as well as many other ones i think like between the two of them they have four or five different podcasts yeah they're they're definitely busy like they're, they're busy guys they're hustlers yep absolutely but we're gonna have them on here 
Sorry, my dogs are in the background here. But, um, yeah, we're going to have them both on. Depending on how long it goes, we might break it up into two parts, just kind of depending. I don't want it to be like a two-hour-long podcast, unfortunately, and have yeah. to make everybody feel like they're suffering through it on the way to work. But, um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. But uh, up until that point, if you have that book out there and you haven't reviewed it yet, go do that. If you're lingering on leaving a review for another author, please go do that. We really appreciate those. Those are like like desserts for us. Yes, review books, share them on social media, and make the next wool happen. Make it happen. <laughs> all right. With all, with all that said, I'm going to raise my cup and say cheers to you. Cheers. <laughs>